please raise your hand if you have a question. We'll try to get to as many people as we can today. Uh, we'll have Coach Yursich right after this. So let's start with uh, Tyler Donahue, 247. Go ahead. Good morning, uh, Manny. Well, good afternoon. How are you today? Good, Tyler. How are you? Doing well. Uh, um, obviously, a lot of your statistics speak for themselves through five games, but what are you most proud of about the way this Penn State defense has performed through five weeks, and what are you gaining long-term from the light workload on a lot of your frontline players? Uh, well, the, the second part first, I mean, obviously we, we are playing less snaps. Um, our offense has had a big help in that with the way that they possess the football. Um, and ideally that just keeps us fresher for the second half of the season, you know, which um, and we've got some guys who have played, um, you know, under 75% fewer snaps than they played this time last year. So there's a real added benefit to that. Um, in terms of what we're pleased with, we're pleased that we're five and zero, um, and we've, uh, you know, we've done what it takes to win these the first games in, in September. Um, I like the fact that as a as a unit, we're starting to to you can feel the soul of our defense. The guys are, are enjoying playing uh, for and with one another. And you're seeing our playmaking distributed amongst a wide group of guys, which is kind of what we want. Uh, that means everyone's doing their job um, and whoever's there to make the play is making it. Let's go to Greg Pickle and then Audrey, you're on deck. Coach, good morning. Thank you for doing this. You got it, Greg. Coach, when you look at Zane Durant's development, obviously a big game for him last week, but a good start to his season uh, over the first five weeks. Just how have you seen him grow as a player and as a person in this defensive line rotation? Yeah, I mean, I mean Zane, you know, we knew – we you saw it last year, um, his athletic ability inside and, and, and his quick twitch – uh, and his ability to make plays on third down. And um, he, he had a great off season, um, got stronger um, and got bigger. And when you have that type of movement inside, it, it really creates a mismatch on those guards. But I think most important is that Zane, like a lot of the guys we have in the sophomore class, Zane is just wired in a, in a certain way that our defense really kind of needed. Some of the, the big personalities we lost off of last year's defense um, Zane kind of is sort of like-minded to those guys. So I think as his role is increased in our defense, I think his, in a way, his actually, his leadership increases in our defense because he's got that dog in him to, that makes other guys want to maybe take their game up a little bit of a different level. Go to Audrey Snyder and then uh, Andrew Clay, you're on deck. Hey, Manny, thanks for doing this. Um, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier that you felt like you're starting to to feel the soul of this defense. Uh, what do you mean by that? Because I know a lot of your guys said back in the summer that they felt that, you know, this could potentially be the, the best defense in the country. Well, what I mean is a defense is a collection of people, right? It's a collective individuals. And and as I mentioned, you you know, you lose the 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 huge personalities like a Jair Brown and a and a Mustafer and and Tarbert and, and I mean there were these were big big locker room personalities and I felt like against West Virginia and even part of Delaware I felt like we were trying to be perfect um, maybe a little tight because as you mentioned there was a lot of talk in the off season about not just as a as a group what we could be but a lot of the our individuals were collectively had had a lot of beautiful wonderful things said about them but then you got to get into the games and. I really think the second quarter, maybe the the the, the first quarter, second quarter of Illinois, um, when all those plays started coming, I think that kind of relaxed us a little bit. And I think from that point, and we started having fun. Um, and we looked like we're having a lot of fun right now. My, one of my favorite plays in the game on Saturday, we told the guys it was, um, we're 10-3 down at Northwestern. We just put them the ball with like five minutes left in the second quarter. So that's not really going according to plan. And uh, our kids, before we took the field on defense, they were they were in a great headspace. They were they were they were ready to go have fun and play. And that the first drive, the first play of that drive was when Zane Durant, Devon Elise, and like seven other guys hit the running back in the backfield for a big tackle for loss. And you just see the spirit and the fun we were playing with. And 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 I think that's kind of what I'm getting at now. I, I think I think we're seeing a little more of that of 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 the eleven guys becoming one in that unit, which which is every every year you've got to sort of piece those pieces together. And, and, and I think we're, I think we've really grown as who we are as a unit in these last three weeks. Let's go to Andrew Clay and then Ali Baruby, you're on deck. 
Hey, Coach, uh, how different is it? How how different are other teams approaching your defense this year than they were last year? And how much has that made you change what you want to do? Uh, well, you know, we haven't, I mean, really other than Northwestern, we haven't played an opponent that we played a year ago. Um, so you're, you're still kind of playing everybody for who they are and, and what they do. Um, you know, now as we get into our league schedule, second half of the season, we'll get more repeat coordinators. Um, even Northwestern was a little bit different than what they had been a year ago. Um, but obviously look, anytime you're, you're, when you're doing things well on either side of the ball, you're going to see things that you did not defend well or, or, or did not, do not attack well. Um, so, you know, it's part of a, of a player that anytime you put something on film that you don't do it well, or as a scheme, as a unit, we don't do it well. We have to know that we're going to see it again. Um, so I think, and then I think obviously what, what people are noticing with our defensive ends is, is we're getting a lot of chipping, uh, a lot more chipping this year. You know, Iowa didn't chip us and, and, and you saw how the ends could dominate the quarterback that way. So you're seeing more tight ends and backs try to chip those guys to try to take those guys out of the game. But then there's, there's a downside to that for what that does offensively and fewer guys can get out on the route. So, um, you know, I, 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 I think as we continue to evolve, I think how people attack us will continue to evolve during the course of the year. Let's go to Allie Berube and then Daniel Galen. Hey, Manny. I think something that we've noticed uh, a lot about the defense is it's not just contributions from one guy. Every game, your turnovers are coming from four or five different players. The fumble recovery is coming from someone else. I mean, how difficult do you think it is for opposing offenses to prepare for who knows who on any given play? Um, and, and how much of a luxury is that for you that you have that many playmakers where any given game you've had a different guy step up and lead the defense? Yeah, well, I think you just said it. The, our, our luxury is that we have a lot of really good players and we have a lot of guys that can make plays. Um, and if you look at our sack numbers, our TFL numbers, our turnover numbers, they are spread out amongst a lot of guys, um, which proves to the to the players that if everyone just does their job, um, the ball will tends to find us. You know, the, the negative plays tend to find us, and just whoever's there, just just get it on the ground and do your job. Um, and that, that we know that if you scale that out over the course of a whole season, um, that there's enough sacks, there's enough turnovers, there's enough TFLs, enough whatever to go around for everybody. So don't don't try to the lesson there is don't try to force it, um, and don't worry about if you're not getting the numbers maybe that you have because just play the long game, you know, run the marathon of the season. Um, and if we keep doing, everyone keeps doing our job the way that we do it right now, there'll be enough of those plays to be made for everybody. So. We, 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 we're proud of the depth that we have, and we're proud of the, the fact that everybody contributes, and it's not just, you know, one guy that an offense can scheme for this one guy. Let's go to Daniel Gallen and then Seth Engel. Hey, Manny, uh, we've seen Kobe King take the majority of, of the reps, I think, at the mic spot. Um, what did he do, you know, through fall camp to earn that position, and what have you seen from him through these first five games of the season? Yeah, Kobe... Um, the 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 really the only thing that was holding Kobe back was just his confidence and understanding um, schematically what to do and how to get us lined up and he he got better and better at that as the year went on uh, last season, um, but I think spring ball when Elston was out with um, you know with a rehab, um, I think that did wonders for Kobe's confidence. I think just playing with the ones and and going and just having a you know being more comfortable with with the calls and getting everybody lined up. Um, it made a big difference with him. And and when Elson came back in, in, in training camp, we thought they both really had good training camps. We felt like both guys um, were starting quality mics. We just felt that, that Kobe had just edged it a little bit. Snap counts have been have been fairly, you know, it, it, we've also played some nickel. So uh, I think another big development is that Abdul can play Mike for us right now. So um, we, it gives us different options against different types of teams. Um, but I think Kobe's, you know, I thought he had his best game on Saturday. He's playing fast. He can make plays in the backfield. And um, it's just fun to see a guy, you know, playing confidence and playing free and having fun out there. Let's go to Seth Angle and then Shane Thomas. Hey, Manny, thanks for doing this. Um, I could imagine, you know, some coaches probably have varying ways of handling the bye week. Um, what have you noticed works best for you in keeping the group focus? And for this week especially, um, what do you want to take away most? Thanks. Well, I think the biggest thing is you want to find a way to get better. You know, I mean, I mean, you, you normally do get better by playing, 
Um, but but uh, it's given us a great opportunity to, to self scout ourselves. You know, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? What do what do our future opponents see when they watch us? Um, so you can kind of turn your gaze inwardly a little bit and make sure that that we're presenting as the best version of ourselves as possible. Um, uh, while at the same time, obviously, you can take some of the load off of your players because we know once we come back um, next season, it's you know it's going to be uh, it's going to be a race. I mean, October, November are going to come through and um, and come and go, and and that's really going to tell the story of our of our football season. So. Uh, you want to make sure that you're ready for that, fresh, healthy, because we, we won't get another buy. This is it. We're going straight through, and and uh, and we got to be as as fresh and ready to go as we can. Go to Shane Thomas and then Johnny McGonigal. Hey Manny, how are you? Perfect. How are you? Doing well. Uh, Deny and Curtis talked about how much you've emphasized playmaking defensively and that aggressive mentality so far. You've been able to win with takeaways and physicality. So how is that mentality? Uh, kind of gotten through to the group and and how you guys have been able to win in different ways. Well, I think what if I, I assume what 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 they're mentioning is they're how the things that we're trying to accomplish where where we are trying to sort of pin the offense in a corner where we have the opportunity to make plays and whether that's you know through pressuring the quarterback or you know leveraging runs for 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 loss or or whatever it is, or changing up a coverage to try to, you know, create a turnover, whatever, whatever it is um, that we do, we, we want to be a defense because we're all about winning. And we know that, you know, everyone, as I've mentioned before, everyone knows that turnovers win games, but how do you create turnovers and how do you leverage an offense into turnovers? Um, and so the importance of, you know, creating negative plays and all those type things. So I think the players are understanding that, um, you know, that we're not out there just to hope that the offense messes up, that we're out there to try to be, um, you know, to be assertive and, and and to be the one who's sort of dictating the, the the state of play. And that's always a challenge every week because those guys are trying to do the same thing on the other side of the ball. And and um, that's kind of the the fun back and forth that that I think makes us all love the sport of football. Let's go to Johnny McGonigal and the T Frank. Thanks for your time, Manny. Really appreciate it. Um, I know you guys have UMass upcoming, but James said after the Northwestern game that there will be some you know, down the line preparation this bye week as well. Uh, and, you know, we might not talk to you uh, over the next couple of weeks. So if you have any, uh, what are your early thoughts or impressions of Ohio State this season? What I would tell you is that we will always, we always work ahead. We, we have a great group of analysts here that are always kind of working on our next couple opponents. Um, so what everyone's going to do during a bye week is you're always going to watch, um, you know, not just your next opponent. You might watch the next two or three opponents try to get get a feel for what's going on down the league. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're in addition to self scouting ourselves, we're we're definitely paying attention to the the games we have coming up and and making sure that when when you go see them on the Sunday of of whether you mentioned it's Ohio State week or whoever else coming down the line, that is not the first time you you know you know we get off the field Sunday night around six o'clock. You come back up in the film. It's not the first time you're watching, getting a feel for who these guys are this year. So. So we're absolutely doing all of that. And um, my opinions are absolutely very strong and they're absolutely going to stay to myself. <laughs> let's, go, let's go to T Frank and then uh, Mark Wogan Rich. Good afternoon, Manny. Um, I want to ask you about your safeties. Uh, just kind of observationally, it seems like Jalen has been splitting time between the field and the boundary. First off, I hope that's accurate. And secondly, the versatility you have back there, what does that do for you as a play caller um, in terms of what you can do and maybe some of the advantages that, uh, you know, the athleticism you have on the back end uh, provides you from, you know, what you can and maybe in other situations you wouldn't be able to call certain things uh, on defense. Yeah, uh, Jalen has uh, been able to play both spots, um, which I, I do think that's very valuable for us. Um, you know, with the safety position, and a lot of times it's going to depend on your matchups, how you feel about your matchups. Um, you know, if you're some sort of man-to-man -man where the, the field safety might have to defend the slot, man, and, and do you feel good about that? Um, and then, you know, who's the better tack, you know, who's the better tackler? Who do you want closer to the box, further away from the box? So those are all the things that we, we think about when we, you know, look at our safeties. And I think, you know, the fact that we've got four that we feel very confident of, of going to the game at any time uh, really helps us. And the biggest thing in that, in that room is to prevent long touchdowns. Um, 
because any great defense starts with not giving up cheap, easy touchdowns. And um, and in fact, I think the only long touchdown we gave this year was Delaware, and and actually our safety wasn't even the deep player in in that defense. So um, that's really the first order of business in that room. Uh, obviously, a guy like Anthony Poindexter is is uh, to have a legend like that to coach him. It really helps those guys develop. And and then um, you know, and then we get to decide how we kind of want to use our chess pieces on any given week. Go to Mark Wilgenrich and then Ben Jones. Hi, Manny. I think it was at Media Day you discussed, you probably discussed this before, about guys not trying to wear capes, do too much, that sort of thing. Were you seeing that in the first two games? And has it dissolved? Has it? Are you seeing that kind of dissipate among the defense? There was a little bit of that. It was just a little bit more. Sometimes it's, it's you can see it where a guy's trying to do someone else's job. And there might have been a little bit of that. It was just more kind of playing up tight. You know, like, again, you just sometimes you, you want to be perfect. Um, and there's that fine line where you put maybe too much pressure on yourself. And, um, you know, I've, I've said this before. It's like trying to hit a a grand slam with no one on base, you know what I mean? And instead of just, you know, just, just play your, play your role, do your job. Um, the plays will come. And, and I think that's where we have relaxed over the last three weeks and guys just understand, okay, you know, you kind of get your first sack and get your first tackle for loss, get your first PBU, whatever it is you realize, okay, you know, this is how it happens. Cause you can forget when you put up big numbers year before, you know, you forget kind of the process, it's like winning a game, you know, you don't ever blow someone out you know, in the first round of, a, of of the fight, you know, sometimes these things, you know, they, you know, you got to play over 60 minutes and the plays are there and, and the team pulls away. And I think for individual performance over a season, um, there's the same thing there. Let's go to Ben Jones and then Derek Bast. Hey man, I appreciate the time today. <clears throat> yeah. My pleasure. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm asking you this as a, as someone, you know, who used to be a head coach when you're evaluating a unit, um, what have you learned about the difference between what it makes you feel when you see it on film versus what it makes you feel when you look at the analytics and the box score? And if those things maybe don't always line up, is there something in there that matters or is it just how it goes sometimes? I'm, I guess the, the question of the box score lining up with and the analytics lining up with the eye test, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly what can happen in a box score is you can have a, you know, I mean, everything with analytics is always about sample size, right? You know, so, um, you know, you can give up, you know, so I'll give you an example. Like, so the, the, the play we gave versus Delaware, that was versus one particular blitz, right? Well, when you, when you evaluate that blitz right now in our, in our five game self scout, it, obviously it's not going to come out very good because there's one horrendous play and maybe the four other times we ran it, they're all good plays. But but for yards per play, it's going to be poor. So I think anytime you're dealing with the numbers, which which I think always help, and we we use them intensively in, in this program, I think you have to understand: are they, um, you know, what's the sample size telling you? Is it something that's policy setting? Is it something that just you want to be aware of? Um, but yeah, I mean, we we check all of our metrics, and then and then ultimately at the end of the day, as you mentioned, you got to check the film, you know, because the film is what tells you, you know, what you're doing well, and what you're not doing well. So I think we try to balance both here. Go to Derek Bass with the Post Gazette. Uh, hi, Manny. Thanks again. Uh, we hear a lot about Chop, Kalen, Curtis, and Abdul maybe for next year as guys who could possibly be first round picks. Who's a guy that you're seeing maybe in the first half of this season? who could assert themselves onto that list as a potential first round pick in this year or the next coming year? Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, the first round pick thing, you know, you know, I don't know about that because that's, you know, the, the NFL decides who becomes first rounders and they got all kinds of things that they got to figure out. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to get our guys to play at a high, as high a level as possible and, 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 and just be better than what they were. So I know you mentioned some of the names that you did, but certainly, um, I think we talk about Adis Isaac and and the level of play that he's put up over the last couple of weeks. I think Adis is really getting to the highest level that I've that I've seen him play at since he's been in college. And and then you hope a guy like uh, Deny Dennis Sutton behind him, um, you know, continue to do the same thing. Uh, you know, at some point we we got to continue to talk about Johnny Dixon, you know, and and how he's playing opposite of of Kalen. So, like I said, I you know I'll leave it to the NFL to decide how they want to rank him in terms of how they want to pick him. Um, you know, our responsibility here is just to develop these guys to the best version of themselves that they can be. And 
I know any coach would say that, but it's still it's still the truth um, because it's you know we, the the better we play here, I have a feeling the more the NFL is going to like him. And and like I said, right now I just like the idea that we have a lot of guys who you know by every metric are playing the best football in their career, and and they've got to keep that up because of the challenges we have ahead. Got time for one more, John Petishnock. Manny, this may be along the lines of the soul of the defense, so I don't mean for this to be repetitive, but is there an aspect of this defense, an intangible aspect that doesn't show up in the box score that one has allowed you to be successful on the field and also has made this a fun group to coach? Yeah, John, I think it's I think it is our our depth. You know, I I, I think it's the fact that we, you know, you could argue a defense is not you know, judge by its strongest link in the chain, but really by its weakest link, right? Because um, you could have a great DN, but if the other DN isn't very good, then they can double the one guy. You can have one great corner, but the other corner is not good. They can go after him. And offenses aren't, they're not dumb. They're, they're going to try to find the weakest part of your defense to try to attack. And and so the more we can keep that guy strong, and, and then the fact that that guy is not in the first 11, but then when you roll a second 11 in there, um, with very little drop off it, where it's not recognizable really who we have in the game based off of how we look. Um, I think that's the funnest part. And I think that's the part where the guys, you know, what I always look for is, is how do guys react when, when their teammates make a play. And when you have a special defense, they react for, for their success of their teammates the same way they react for the, for their own success, if not sometimes even more excited. And, and I think that's the benefit when they're all bought into the fact that, I'm so happy you made a play because I know that you're going to do your job so I can make a play in return. And and I think that's where that, that soul comes from. All right. Thank you very much, Manny. Uh, we'll